Hey everyone and welcome to my second video in a series covering Microsoft Excel tips and tools that every engineer should know. In this one I'll be covering box plots and I know you're thinking box plots really? I learned how to make those in elementary school why would I want to watch this? But I encourage you to watch all the way through for two reasons. First because most people learned how to use these plots so long ago I think they forgot what it actually tells us about data and how useful it is. Second because I'm going to show you some really cool ways to use box plots that are less commonly known and probably more advanced than what you learned in elementary school. So if you watched my last video where I talked about histograms this probably looks familiar to you. Um, we're going to look at the shaft diameter here. We have a bunch of measurements of different shafts, and we're measuring this diameter um, throughout different production runs. So here's our data, and if we just select this, let's insert a box plot to look at what that does. Now I'm going to go ahead and adjust the scale on the side here. Oops, access options, and we're going to set the minimum a little bit higher just so it doesn't scrunch our box plot up so much. So let's set it to 0.987. That kind of spreads it out, makes it look a little neater for us. I'm just going to drag this down even a little bit more. So this is a box plot, and you're probably somewhat familiar with this. It's pretty common that people know about what this is. But what this is telling us is a number of things. So we have this line going right through the middle, and that's actually going to be the median. And the median is the point at which 50% of the data points are above and 50% of the data points are below. And then what forms the box is this line here and this line here. Those are our quartiles, um, quartile one and quartile three up here. They're the 25% marks. So below this line, quartile one, are 25% of the values. And above this line, or quartile three, are 25% of the values. And then between those two lines are 50% of the values. And the distance between quartile one and quartile three, in other words, quartile three minus quartile one, is called the interquartile range. And the other thing you'll notice is these little lines with the ends sticking out. You might have also heard a box plot be called a box and whisker plot. So these lines with the ends are called the whiskers. And we get those by taking the interquartile range times 1.5, and then that is the length of our whiskers. So if we took our Q3 value, or a quartile 3 value, and added 1.5 times this IQR, or interquartile range, we would get this point here. And similarly, if we took the quartile 1 value minus 1.5, the IQR, we would get this point here. One other note about the whiskers is that in a perfectly normally distributed data set, there would be something like 99.7% of the values between the ends of the whiskers. Now the last part of a box and whisker plot is this little dot out here, and that's called an outlier. And I'm sure everybody's pretty familiar with those. But basically, because 99.7% of the data points are between this upper and lower fence, or between the whiskers, um, we can pretty safely assume based on our data set that any values that fall outside of that are going to be outliers or extreme values or not normal given the data we have in our data set. You may have also noticed this little X toward the center of the box. That's actually the mean value and that's not always included in a box and whisker plot but Excel does include that and it can be handy. Comparing the mean and median oftentimes tells us about the skewness of the data. So basically, similarly to a histogram like I talked about in the last video, a box and whisker plot tells us where our values lie on a number line. In other words, how the data is distributed. So in this example, we can see that 50% of the data points are between about 0.997 and it looks like about one inch. So 50% of the data points are between that range and then with fewer data points outside of there. And then we do have this one outlier, which again, definitely is something that we would wanna investigate, try to figure out why is that one shaft, why was that cut to such a small diameter compared to the rest of our data? And I guarantee that there is some uh, reason behind that, whether that be a measurement error or some kind of process error or operator training or something like that. There's some root cause behind this outlier, which definitely needs investigating. All right, on to the next example. So one thing that's cool about using box plots in Excel is that we can subcategorize the box and whisker plots by a category. So we're gonna look at some different fan designs here and compare how much cubic feet per minute they can move. So let's grab all of our data here and hit insert and then go to our box plot. And now we can see the box plot for each fan design. So that's pretty cool. That's one limitation of histograms is you can only look at univariate data sets and you can't uh, subcategorize them. So this way we can actually see different categories or different things that we want to look at box plots for. So one thing that's interesting about this example is each fan design has a different distribution. The third fan design looks like it has the highest median and mean value for CFM that it's producing, but the second fan design has much less variation. So I might almost choose the second fan design 
because it has so much less variation. It has about the same mean value, so on average it's going to produce about the same CFM, but it's a lot more predictable. This fan has the opportunity to produce a much higher CFM or a much lower CFM, so the customer um, might get very varied results, and that might not be such a good thing. So I would almost choose this fan design um, based on this analysis. All right, on to the third example. So here we're looking at some order data. And we have the order number, the date it was completed, and then using this fancy formula here, I've converted it to tell us what week range this date falls under so we can kind of bin our dates into, um, into weeks in order to uh, give us some subcategories for our box plots. And then we have the units completed for that order on that date. So I feel like a lot of companies, when they look at something like this, if they want to see the number of units completed over time, kind of look at like a time series plot, they might take this and they might do like a pivot table and they might drop in the completion date and the units completed to kind of summarize the values. And then we can actually group this by weeks right into our pivot table here. So if we go like this and then enter seven there for weeks. So we kind of have a similar thing here and that's the sum. So let's switch this to an average. So here is a time series by week of the average number of units completed per week. And we can insert a chart of that just to kind of look at it over time and insert that. And look at that, look at that. It looks like we have this kind of trend where the number of units we're completing is going upward. And that looks great. And that's how a lot of companies report metrics. But the problem with this is that is a very small part of the story behind this data. So using box plots, we can get a much clearer picture of what's actually happening with this data. So again, I've kind of categorized it by week. So we can grab our data here and insert a box plot and it'll give us like a time series um, of the units completed over time. And this is really cool. I think this is one of the coolest ways to use box plots is the variation of something over time. So we have the same story where our mean is kind of going up and down, up and down, it's going up. And it looks like things are getting better if we look solely at the mean value. But what's also happening is the variation is growing within our process. So somehow the variation of the units completed per day is growing. And if you're familiar with manufacturing processes at all, variation is a terrible thing. Um, it creates excess whip or not enough whip. And it, there's just all kinds of things um, that variation causes within a manufacturing process that's really not good. So uh, what's cool about box plots again is that it just gives us the ability to see the variation um, as well as the average. So hopefully this one didn't bring back too many bad memories from middle school math class. I also hope you have a better understanding of how to use box plots, why they can be useful, and how to create one for yourself. Let me know in the comments below if you have any other cool ways of using box and whisker plots in your business. And if this is something you've never seen before and you learned something from this video, let me know how you plan to incorporate this into your engineering toolbox. Thanks for watching. All right, I hope you all enjoyed that one. To get more videos as they are released, make sure to hit that subscribe button. If you like this video, make sure to like and share. And if you didn't like it, well, then leave me a comment and let me know how I can improve. Last but not least, this channel is for you. So if you have any suggestions for topics you want me to cover, make sure to let me know. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.